Can we have a moment of silence for my freaking shirt? Look at this beauty. This looks so weird. Um, look at the back. I hope that you can see it in all its glory. It's from Studio House Designs. They make pretty much all of the horror merch that you see me wear in my videos. It's my favorite horror merch company, and this one is just so stunning. Anyway, today we're going to be doing a video that is very, very late. Um, I haven't done a what I watched in the month uh, since before I had a baby. So it's been probably a year. I don't even know when the last time I did it, but it's been forever, but I knew I wanted to do one for October because what better month to do it than the one that I'm like jam packing all this new stuff that I'm watching into the month for the sake of Halloween. So it's really late. I hope you still care about everything that I watched in October. And another reason why I wanted to do this video also is because I did a whole video on my watch list for October. So you knew what was gonna be on my watch list and a lot of you wanted reviews after I made that video for those things. So we're gonna do that today. Did I get around to my entire watch list? Of course not. Also, this video will not include any of the Halloween franchise that I watched because I did a whole ranking video on the franchise already. So any of the Halloween movies I watched in the month, I'm not putting in this video. So if you haven't watched my ranking, go watch my Halloween franchise ranking over here. Um, it's said to be a little bit controversial with one of the rankings, specifically Resurrection. Anyway, the first thing that I saw in the month of October was Saw 10, Saw X, whatever you wanna call it. I'll link my full review up here, but it's on track to be my favorite movie of the year. It's, it's my favorite movie of the year. I'm just gonna say that. Now, there's still a couple more releases through the end of the year, but let me just say it is my favorite movie of the year, I think. There's some other good contenders. Stay tuned for my yearly wrap up video where I review, or not even review, where I talk about all the movies that I watched in the year and do the best and worst ranking. Um, but I just don't see any others topping Saw 10, to be honest. But go watch my full review. Next, I watched No One Will Save You. This is one that was really highly talked about online. And even in person, I had friends ask me about it. Um, and my friends watched it, even the ones that aren't like super, super into horror movies. So I thought that was interesting. It was kind of making waves, if you will. It was very popular. <laughs> Bryn finds solace within the walls of the home where she grew up until she's awakened one night by, a, by strange noises from unearthly intruders. Now this, the reason why this one got so popular and kind of became famous this year, and this one was a really recent release as well, um, is because there's no dialogue. There's five words spoken in the entire movie. I love movies like that as long as everything on screen is visually enticing and like nice to look at and things are moving at a good pace. I think having no dialogue is an artistic choice and I am all here for it. I thought it was really effective in this one. Um, I had friends that didn't really like it, but I really liked it personally. I thought it was a very easy sci-fi thriller alien movie. There wasn't anything like really horrific in this movie. Like none of the visuals really bothered me or you know, like was that horror element. I didn't really get a lot of that, which was a little bit disappointing. Um, and I probably would have rated it higher had the aliens been a little bit more effective, but I like that they are inspired by like true accounts from people who have been said or who claim to have been abducted by aliens. Um, they're kind of based on those types of aliens. So I, I respect that. Also home invasions just aren't my favorite subgenre. If you've been around for a while, you've heard me say that before. It's not my favorite type of horror. It's not that effective for me. It is a little bit more effective now that I'm a mother. So, because that is obviously a nightmare situation. Um, but I don't live in, I haven't lived in a house in a long time. I don't live in a house, I live in an apartment. And those are rare to have home invasions in. So I'm not really, scared by home invasion movies typically. So this is like a home invasion, but with aliens. Um, and I liked that. I thought it was really interesting. I love the concept of the movie and it was almost hard to tell the time period in this. I mean, obviously there were things as it moved along that like gave away what time period this was actually in. It felt like an older movie. And also the beginning and something about the character that Caitlin Dever played reminded me of Last Night in Soho, especially like the beginning and just like the, the setup of the movie kind of reminded me because they're both like fashion people or like one's a, you know, sewer. She sews her own clothes and one's a fashion designer, but still like something about that um, was very reminiscent of Last Night in Soho to me and you know how much I am obsessed with that movie. But Caitlin Dever did so well in this role. I think she definitely carried it and could do the performance that was needed for a no dialogue movie. So overall, I gave it three and a half out of five. It was pretty solid. I don't know that I would be like super excited to rewatch it, um, but it's a very easy thriller with not 
there's like a, some story. That, I mean, there's a story there. Obviously, it's a movie, but there's not like too much. It's not overwhelming. Um, and it's just a very simple kind of movie, especially because there's no words. Next up, I watched Monster Inside, which is the documentary on the McKamey Manor. I was so interested in this because like most horror fans or Halloween fans, we are, you know, Ob not obsessed, but like we love to talk about McKamey Manor and like how fascinating that place is and how disgusting it is and how bad Russ McKamey is. So I ended up watching that. I don't even think I ranked it on Letterboxd. It's just, I don't really rank movies that feel like they don't need a ranking. Like I don't need to rank or like rate, sorry, not rank. I don't need to rate this documentary. You know, it was fine. I did feel like it was a little exploitative a little bit like some of the visuals and the reenactments were like oof okay um so it's definitely like more on the disturbing side um but you know for someone who is interested in McKamey Manor I think that's what they're signing up for to begin with so that's kind of what you would expect from a documentary about Russ McKamey. Okay next up was one that was on my list which was Rose Red. You guys saw it was on my watch list. It had been decades probably since I'd seen it the first time and so I watched it. I rewatched it and it was so funny because right after I made that video Hulu shared that it was going to be put on Hulu. Like Rose Red was going to be put on Hulu and I'm like you could not find this anywhere and all of a sudden I talk about it and I'm not saying I caused that but it's just like a coincidence of timing. So a lot of you actually watched it in October as well because Hulu put it on there and I was so excited for all of us to actually be able to see it. So it's about a college professor and a team of psychics who investigate in an old abandoned house. They're hoping to explain some of the mysterious deaths and disappearances on the property and the psychics stay in the mansion but unleash a terrifying force that threatens to destroy them all. This was so cheesy, but it was such like a cheesy nostalgic watch for me. I loved rewatching this. It was pretty much better than I imagined or from better than what I remembered um, from like two decades ago. It's just like a comfy watch and I could definitely see myself rewatching this every year around Halloween. I don't know, it's not Halloween related, but something about it feels very fall time. So if you haven't watched it yet, it is on Hulu and we're still in the fall. So please watch it if you're wanting something that's just like a comfy watch that's like a little bit on the cheesier end from the early 2000s. It's just so good. But again, it's cheesy, okay? There's some acting that is very questionable and the acting's definitely worse than I remembered. But four out of five, I love Rose Red and I'll continue to love it. Part of it is the nostalgia for me from watching it when I was younger, so keep that in mind if you are watching this for the first time now. Um, it's not like the best Stephen King story ever made, but it's still really good. Okay, the next one is a first time watch for me that a lot of you were really excited to hear my thoughts on and pretty much the reason I'm doing this video still, even though it's so delayed. Normally I'd be like, well, whatever, I'm just not gonna do the video because no one probably cares anymore, but a lot of you were interested in my thoughts on The Changeling from 1980. To start with grief, composer John Russell leaves his home in New York City for a giant secluded house near Seattle. Soon Russell starts to feel the presence of a ghost, a boy who drowned in the bathtub. Russell seeks the assistance of Claire Norman, who led him to the house initially and uncovering the secrets of the boy's death. Now, I wanted to watch this specifically in, Oct in October because I've heard it's like a really comfy fall watch, and it was, definitely. How's that haunted house atmosphere that I was looking for in October. I was just really in the mood for some like spooky supernatural movies because I had been like binge watching the Halloween franchise. So although those aren't super gory by any means, it's more, they're slasher movies, right? So I wanted something like ghosty, spooky, atmospheric, you know, for Halloween. And now I did think that The Changeling, I liked the story overall, but I did find it to be a little bit slower. Again, I say this and then I get so many comments of hate when I say this, that older movies are typically not my favorite. So this era of horror movies, 1980, not my favorite. Do I love a lot of movies from that era? Absolutely. Have to make that disclaimer every time, but generally I'm not drawn to the era. Um, and so this one was like a little bit slower of a slow burn for me. And I wanted so much more ghosty stuff happening in the house, especially because, you know, the setting is beautiful. However, speaking of setting, I didn't like that this set was completely fake. Like they didn't find a mansion that they could film in. So they just created one and it almost, you could almost tell 
Um, I loved the set decorations. Like I loved the set building that they did, but they were just a collection of sets that were just like put together. And then the exterior was like a false exterior that they used on just like a random house. So while it was beautiful, I do wish that they had like a real haunted mansion. That would have been really, you know, a, a better atmosphere for me personally. <laughs> so I gave this one three and a half out of five. I would definitely rewatch it. It's very, very cozy and comfy and folly. Seattle, Washington, you know, it's stunning. The Everything's visually beautiful in this movie, um, but I did want more horror. I wanted a little bit more in there. Okay, so next up was another new release. Um, there were, I think, four releases, in, like major releases in the month of October, and I watched a handful of them. I didn't get to Five Nights at Freddy's. I haven't watched that, um, to be honest. I don't want to. I don't want to. I haven't watched The Exorcist Believer either. Also didn't want to watch this one, but I did for the sake of doing my year in review video, which I'll probably get to the other two, you know, for that video as well, because I know some of you want to hear my thoughts on it. I'm just not excited about a lot of the horror movies coming out. It's just a little side tangent. Um, I'm just not excited about a lot of them. So this year isn't that strong for horror, in my opinion, and just a lot of like reboots and like sequels and things that I don't need. The Exorcist, Pet Cemetery Bloodlines, I don't know. Five Nights at Freddy's is not my kind of movie. I didn't play the video games. I have no rep reference for that movie at all, so it's, I'm not the market for it. Anyway, but let's talk about Pet Cemetery Bloodlines. I did watch that. I love the original. The original is one of the first horror movies I ever watched and the first Stephen King book I ever read. So I love Pet Cemetery, the original. However, was not excited for Bloodlines. I don't think we needed it. Just like we didn't need the remake. The remake of Pet Cemetery is one of the worst movies I have ever seen in my life. Um, and I've seen a lot, you know? And Bloodlines, the concept was interesting. So let me tell you what it's about. In 1969, a young Judd Crandall dreams of leaving his hometown of Ludlow, Maine, but soon discovers sinister secrets buried within. Judd is forced to confront a dark family history that will forever keep him connected to Ludlow. So I get it. The concept is cool with Judd. We're following Judd's character. He's obviously a major character in the original, or, you know, he's a side character, but he's important to the story. So it's cool to see like his origin and everything and like his history and the history of the Pet Cemetery and Ludlow, Maine, right? But I just feel like the execution was not there and it it wasn't terrible. It wasn't terrible, but it wasn't anything, anything great. I gave it a two and a half out of five. It's like right in the middle for me of good and bad. It's just, it's like a, a nothing movie to me. I know that's mean to say because it's one thing to like hate a movie because you feel like certain emotions for it. Sometimes that's, you know, warranted. But to say that you feel nothing for a movie is probably the worst insult you could do. So I feel bad saying that. It just, it wasn't for me. It was not for me. But the thing is, it was fine. It was, it was fine of a movie. Like the performances were fine. The horror, I guess, was fine. The origin, the story was fine, but it was just fine. And so there was nothing exciting about it to me personally. Maybe if you really, really love the franchise in general and you love it a lot, then this would be like right up your alley, but I don't know. Okay, then I watched Slither. It was a rewatch for me. It was actually a movie night that I did with my friend AJ. I will link their Instagram down below because they did an incredible series of 31 Days of Halloween. You have to go check it out. Um, so yeah, I did a movie night with them and, did, and we watched Slither and they didn't like it. So, sorry. I'm sorry to my friend, AJ. <laughs> I love Slither. I think it's great. Um, it's so campy. It's done by James Gunn. So, you know, it's a certain expectation there with his movies, but I, I enjoy Slither a lot. Okay, another new release that I watched in October was VHS 85. Ironically, I wanted to watch this. I kind of forced myself to watch Pet Cemetery Bloodlines, but VHS 85, I was like, you know, they're shorts. It's just short, you know, if I don't like it, I could just stop at any point because, you know, there's like five tales going on. So I don't know, but I wanted to watch it and I watched all of it in one sitting. Did not expect that and I liked it. Again, was not super excited about VHS 85 specifically for two reasons. One, I did not like 99. I wish I did because that is my era of horror. Hated it. Um, and then 85, 80s. Not for me. I'm really tired of the 80s personally, like bringing back the 80s constantly. Of course, VHS was gonna do something in the 80s at some point if they did 94, 99, and now 85. 
I'm just done with the eras of 80, of uh, VHS in general. Like, can we stop doing that? But it was one of the better VHS movies, if I do say so myself. Like, there were some stories better than others, like usual, but they had some really good names on this one that I was really excited about. Specifically, we have David Bruckner who made The Night House. He also made The Ritual, both of those obsessed with. Um, and then he had a short in the original VHS. He also made Southbound, another an anthology movie that I really love. Anyway, I saw his name was attached to VHS 85 and I was like, you know what? I'm gonna give it a chance. I think it'll be good. And then also Scott Derrickson, who famously made Sinister, supposedly one of the scariest movies of all time. It's scary, not as scary to me. Um, but he also made The Black Phone, which I really didn't like. So that was gonna be hit or miss for me. Anyway, I was pleasantly surprised by the fact that I liked VHS 85. I didn't like the third story, um, but every other story really, I mean, it still kept caught kept my attention though. That's the thing is like all the stories were really fascinating and interesting. And I liked, I liked all of them really. The third one was just like my least favorite, but I was still like glued to the TV of like, what's gonna happen next, you know? It's still not perfect. It's still like not my favorite movie that came out this year, obviously. I gave it a three out of five. It's, it's solid. If you like the VHS franchise in general, I think 85 is actually really strong. So next I watched Perfect Blue, which is an anime movie. It's more of like a thriller than a horror movie, I would say, but it's still described as horror because it is quite disturbing. Um, and also this came out in 1997. So I watched it with my partner because he actually really likes anime. And this follows a young Japanese singer who is encouraged by her agent to quit singing and pursue an acting career beginning with a role in a murder mystery TV show. I loved this movie. And I don't watch anime on a regular basis. I've seen some before and I'm interested in you know, anime generally and some movies, um, specifically this one, obviously if it's a horror themed, then I'm going to be more interested in it. Um, but this one was so good and I'm so disappointed I didn't watch this sooner. However, I probably, maybe I'd rewatch it. I don't know. It's hard. It's a hard watch for sure. There is an SA scene in it that I can't, say too much about. I don't want to like spoil anything, but it's not like all what it seems. <laughs> this movie's wild though. I was so hooked, especially like from the halfway point on, I was like, oh my God, what is happening? What is happening? It gets so bizarre and so entertaining. Like it was so good. And again, because I don't watch a lot of anime, I wasn't sure how I was going to feel about this one, um, but I was, I loved the plot and the story. And they actually initially intended this to be live action, but I'm really happy it wasn't live action. I think they actually remade it into a live action movie, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but you just can't capture the like coloring and everything and like make it as bizarre with the cuts cut scenes and everything that you can when it's animated, right? So I gave this a four out of five. It was solid. I really, really enjoyed this so, so much. And originally I was thinking I wouldn't rewatch it because of the disturbing nature of some of the content in it, but I think I would rewatch it. I think I would revisit it. So the last new release that I watched in the month of October, The Fall of the House of Usher, of course. How could I not watch House of Usher? Everyone was talking about it. I love Mike Flanagan. He's probably one of the most talented creators that we have of our time, horror creators specifically. So siblings Roderick and Madeline Usher have built a pharmaceutical company into an empire of wealth, privilege, and power. However, secrets come to light when the heirs of the Usher dynasty start dying. So this one was so entertaining. Like I couldn't stop watching it. And I saw that being said a lot on social media that people watch this in one sitting. Don't know how you can do that. But a lot of people like binge this show because it's so good. Um, I also would watch multiple episodes in a row, which is really rare for me. And I watched this really quickly and I was so so hooked to the story. However, not rewatchable, unlike some of his other uh, shows that he's done. I think part of it is that no one is good. Like you're not rooting for literally anyone except for one person in this whole show. Like not one person. <laughs> like they all are just so unlikable. And that's difficult because you want to either relate to a character. I mean, everyone watches you know, things for different reasons and, you know, for the sake of entertainment, that's fine. For me, I like to 
have like empathy towards the characters or sympathy even or you know relate to them a little bit and I could not do that with any of the characters in House of Usher like all of them are so unlikable so that's why this one's not really a good rewatch for me and a lot of the content in it is not my style of you know depravity that I like if you know you know so not a rewatchable season for me by any means but it was really good like he is a solid storyteller I'm not gonna lie and also another reason why this one isn't necessarily I'm not the audience for is because I'm not familiar with Edgar Allan Poe really at all I know like cliche things about Edgar Allan Poe of course and of him obviously um but I never really like read any of his stuff so I think that's one of the reasons why I didn't enjoy this maybe as some others because I didn't get all the references. Um, my partner did tell me about a couple stories that he remembered and they did do that in the show so that was cool to see so I'm sure if I had actually experienced the stories for myself firsthand and like known about him more and his work then it would have been way more entertaining but I still gave it four out of five. I still think it's a really good show but only for the one time. Uh, like I was hooked, but now that I have seen it all, I don't feel the need to like rewatch any of it. I do wanna say that throughout the month of October, I was rewatching Haunting of Hill House, which is my favorite TV, horror TV show of all time. Uh, it's my favorite thing that Mike Flanagan has ever done. It is the most perfect, beautiful show. And to me, it's very rewatchable. This year, rewatching it was a little bit more therapeutic. Um, as you guys know, I lost my dad earlier in the year. So for me, it was like a little bit, it was therapeutic. I was crying in like every episode, which I've never done when I watched that show. I was just feeling it so much and like so connected to the show again. It's just, it's a beautiful show and I would probably cry regardless. Um, but yeah, to have that, it was very therapeutic to watch. I'm still not finished with the show, but I was like, sporadically watching an episode here and there throughout October. And then on Halloween, on the day, I watched Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark because I love that movie and it was the perfect Halloween atmosphere for me and I just felt like a comfy rewatch, nothing too exciting. So that's all I watched in October. I did not get to a lot of my watch list and that's okay, but I'm still really proud of the new watches that I watched and like branching out to different things that I no don't normally focus on, you know, a film from 1980, I watched an anime horror film, so I'm happy with that. And multiple new releases, No One Will Save You, Pet Cemetery, VHS 85, House of Usher, so lots of new stuff going on. And then of course, throughout all of that, I was watching the Halloween franchise, so. Let me know what your favorite thing is that you watched in the month of October down below. We could all use some new recommendations, of course, building our November watch list. My November watch list looks very different to my October watch list, but that's okay, I love watching horror movies, specifically in November and December. Of course, October is exciting because it's Halloween. You get to watch all the Halloween movies, um, but also November and December should not be underestimated when it comes to horror movies that you can watch in that time because there are so many good fall, like cozy, cold weather, Christmas, also adjacent movies. I've done videos on those before, so before you go and request for my watch list for November and December, I've done like Christmas, winter, uh, themed horror movies before. I've done a TikTok on November, movies to watch in November. I've done kind of recommendations for that in the past, but maybe I'll post something on my Instagram stories if you want to go follow me. Um, I'll link it down below so you can like see my watch list over there. Anyway, let me know what you enjoyed in October. Did you watch everything on your watch list? Did you get to it? Did you do 31 days of horror? Some people do that. That's a feat, let me tell you. Um, but yeah, leave a comment down below. I hope you enjoyed and I will talk to you soon. Bye.